The skies were clear, the sun shining, and the hot air breathed down the necks of the citizens across Seattle. A normal day in this year's unusually dry spring. However, it would turn out to be anything but normal. It was on this glorious day that the city of Seattle burned to the ground. It was on this glorious day that the Great Seattle Fire made its impact. Before the fire, the city of Seattle would have appeared to be an average frontier town. Smelly, ramshackle, really what you'd consider a wild west town. Seattle's economy consisted primarily of logging a rather slow business that showed no real initiative for profit. Most of the buildings were made out of wood. The majority of these were also one to two stories tall. They were densely packed and were constructed poorly. The sewage systems of Seattle were abysmal, consisting of a wooden pipe system owned by a private water company. Twice a day at high tide, the toilets would do a Mount St. Helens and the sewers would regurgitate their contents into the streets because of the upward pressure of the rising tide. The fire department was very minimal, if you can even say they had one. It was strictly volunteer and there were no professionals on the force. In addition to this, Seattle had its own breed of people. You could describe Seattle as... Full of uh, very opportunistic people. People that wanted to just make money and they didn't really care about the results of tomorrow. You know, they were out for their own good and not for the benefit of society. One of these citizens was a young Swedish carpenter by the name of John E. Back. On the afternoon of June 6th, Back was in Victor Claremont's woodworking shop, which was located in the Pontius building on 1st and Madison. This was Back's account of the fire in an interview that was held by the Post Intelligence Service. I cut some balls of glue and put them in the glue pot on the stove. I put in some shaving where there was little fire. After a while, somebody said, look at the glue and everything take fire. Sometime after 2.15, the glue boiled over, caught fire, and spread to the floors, which were covered by wood chips and turpentine. Back then tried to put out the fire with water, but that mixed with the turpentine also caught fire. Rapidly, the fire spread all around the room, and Claremont's shop, along with the entire MJ Pontius building, went up in flames. So started the Great Seattle Fire. The flames were first seen from steamers lying along Seattle's waterfront. The captain sounded the alarm at a quarter to three on the afternoon of June 6, 1889. Soon engine company number one was attaching two two and a half inch lines to a hydrant at the corner of Front and Columbia Streets, two blocks south of the fire, while engine company number two dropped a hose under a dock of nearby Elliott Bay and took up position at the rear of the building. Crowds flocked to the source of the fire and cheered as firemen fearlessly raised their hoses. Slowly, the fire appeared to become controllable as flames began to erupt towards the north end of the building. Firemen began to realize a problem with the Pontius fire that chilled their conference. The downtown water pressure of 120 pounds could only support three or four decent streams of water for 20 minutes after the firemen began using them. As a result, the hydrants were quite useless. The firefighters expected the four-story brick opera house to serve as an effective barrier to the fire but its roof soon ignited and the building was completely gutted within minutes. Shortly, the large Coleman Block building, a two-story framed building extending from Marion to Columbia Streets, burst into flames as well. One hour later, the flames spread into two hardware stores that contained an estimated 20 to 50 tons of ammunition and gunpowder. The result, a barrage of bullets, was also paired with exploding oil, paint, and alcohol drums, which were set off by the fire. By 4 o'clock in the afternoon, flames spread to the roads, which were incidentally filled with sawdust. In no time at all, the roads also ignited. Moving at the rate of a football field per half hour, the fire reached Seattle's densest business soon. At this point, the fire was so hot that buildings collapsed and melted even before the fire touched them. By 6, the fire destroyed six wars and then begun to consume the merchandise that had been loaded upon them by the mayor's teams. For three more hours, the fire lit up the night and eventually burned itself out. Slowly, the citizens of Seattle crawled out from under ashes and saw the full scale of the destruction of their city. Soon after the fire, British author Rudyard Kipling visited Seattle. In his journal he writes, The town was built upon a hill. In the heart of the business quarters there was a horrible black smudge, as though a hand had come down and rubbed the place smooth. I know now what being wiped out means. Truly, the city was indeed wiped out, for reports had shown that the amount of damage was enormous. 
Every newspaper, hotel, telegraph, railroad depot, and wharf in the city had been completely destroyed. An estimated 120 acres, or 25 city blocks, had been destroyed. The Fry Opera House, the Yesler Building, Dexter and Horton Bank, the Occidental Hotel, each was a shade of its past glory. Although no one died as a result of the fire, thousands of people were displaced and 5,000 men lost their jobs. The city estimated its losses at over $8 million, and that number didn't even include personal losses or those of water and electrical services. Today, historians estimate the total losses at over $20 million. The city did not spare much time for mourning, and instead began to organize relief efforts immediately. Hardly had the flames died out when anxiety and dread gave place to cheerfulness, confidence, and determination. While there were coals burning amongst their feet, they were still conducting business. There is a real sense of determination here in Seattle, and the fire didn't dampen that one bit. It made it stronger. Instead of relocating, most businesses quickly rebuilt upon their ashes and erected temporary white tents from which they conducted their business. Soon Seattle was covered in white tents which piebald the landscape. Workers not only operated their businesses in these tents, but they made their homes in these canvases. This not only helped the customers, but it also helped these businesses amass a large revenue. The most immediate relief arrived in the form of the Tacoma Relief Bureau. The day after the fire, a train rolled into Seattle carrying several cartloads of blankets, tents, and food for Seattleites. News of the fire spread quickly. The fire happened on a day when no other major tragedies happened across the U.S. So, we were like front page news all across the country. Soon, donations and telegrams offering aid began pouring in from all over the country. The list of those donating to aid the fire victims was many pages in length. In no time, the Seattleites had enough money and provisions to recuperate. America now knew exactly what and where Seattle was, thus evolving it into the gateway to the Klondike. Therefore, the fire ultimately accelerated the development of the frontier and fueled the largest boom in Northwest history. The citizens of Seattle wasted no time in rebuilding their city. On June 7th, just one day after the fire, Mayor Robert Moran called several prominent city and business leaders to a meeting at the armory. Having learned their lesson, the assembly decreed that only brick buildings would be allowed in the burnt district. After the fire, 117 brick buildings, which cost the city the equivalent of $140 million $2,007 were constructed. Comparatively, only $20 million was spent on wooden buildings. Within a week of the fire, the city went to work on a new building ordinance. The ordinance required that all buildings be at least two stories high, all walls to be at least 12 inches thick, the foundations to be at least four feet beneath the grade, and division walls to prevent fires from spreading. Next, the city replatted and regraded nearly all of the streets in the burnt district. In the course of this action, the streets were raised 22 feet. This allowed them to be widened from the 60 feet to the ambitious 88 feet. The new streets were paved with stone and iron. Four months after the fire, the city council authorized a professional fire department and 32 men were hired on the spot. Also, the city bought the fire boat to Wamish, two more fire engines, and horse teams. In addition to this, the women of the city got together and formed a beautification program which planted 3,000 new trees on the streets of Seattle. Although the Great Seattle Fire was indeed a tragic event, it contains elements of triumph for it united the community and spurred the birth of a new Seattle. Truly. More good than bad came out of the fire. In 1885, the population of Seattle numbered 9,687. In December 1889, just six months after the fire, the population of Seattle skyrocketed to a whopping 42,000. With the dramatic increase in population came a dramatic increase in revenue. In the aftermath of the fire, the city funds gained $5 million, which Seattleites used to construct the burn district and improve their city. On July 2nd, the Seattle Times confidently proclaimed like the imaginary bird of ancient fable, Seattle has already begun to rise from the ashes of her former self and is putting on the raiment of magnificence and greatness. It is true that Seattle, an average frontier town, died in the Great Fire of June 6, 1889. But on this day, something new arose from the ashes. Seattle, Phoenix of the Northwest.